all of them had to sign that paper in there for the surrender. The other German knows they stood up, just nodded their heads, and then we took them up to uh, Eisenhower, and he wanted them to come up there to him after we surrounded. He didn't want to be in the room with them. First thing he asked them was they satisfied with the way the things went for the signing. They said yes, and he dismissed them. Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. I'm honored to be joined today by Louis Graziano. He is a World War II veteran of the U.S. Army. He's also the author of A Patriot's Memoirs of World War II. And Mr. Graziano, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you. Where were you born and raised, sir? I was born in East Aurora, New York. I grew up there until I uh, went into the service. Tell us a little bit about your family and growing up in the yeah. Depression. <clears throat> Well, yes, I had, uh, we were five children, and my parents came from Italy, and uh, they had time getting started because I didn't uh, know the language good. I remember one time my mother needed some eggs, and she went to the store, and uh, they didn't understand what she wanted, so she squatted down and went like a chicken and went to her wings and and the guy got the message and she got the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Was there any other military service in your family? Yes, my son is uh, was in Vietnam. He, he was in the Marines and he's got the two tours in Vietnam and got three Purple Hearts. Wow. Then I got two nephews or grandchildren that are in the Navy. That's quite a legacy you right started. Now, yeah. That's outstanding. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, more about you growing up, and that's that uh, you started working as a Mason, mm -hmm. uh, yes, like your dad. With, with my father, yeah. Mm -hmm. and but, then, but another career got your attention. And then I went to the, decided to go to the beauty school because my sister had the beauty shop and my, other sisters worked there too, and so I went to school and learned the styling, went to work with her until I got inducted into service. And when was that? In 1943, January. Did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I was uh, drafted, and I went to uh, Fort Niagara, uh, and when I got there, the first night, the captain come in and he says, you got to cut your mustache off. That didn't make sense to me. But he says, you have to cut it off or else. And I didn't know what or else was, being a rookie, so I just cut it off. And then I uh, got transferred out of there to Fort uh, Hood in Texas, which... Right which was Camp Hood at that time. And I let my mustache grow again and nobody said to take it off anymore. And there I was, and when I got down to Camp Hood, I had to, uh, myself and two other soldiers, we had to peel six bushels of potatoes that first night. And then we were transferred to uh, six weeks of combat training and from there, we were sent to uh, Fort uh, uh, Brown, it was in uh, New York, anyway. Fort uh, Drum? Is it Fort Drum? No. No. It was, uh, can't quite remember the name right now. That's all right. Anyway, from there, we had four weeks of more combat training, and then we were sent to uh, Fort Dix to get ready to go overseas. <clears throat> and the night before we got on a ship, I went to town and had made a record for my father 
I mean, and the records that I made told him how what we was going to do to Mussolini when we got there. And, and everything I said came true, just like I said. It happened to him. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. And, of course, my father played that record all the time I was gone. Was Mussolini the reason your father left Italy? No, he, he came over Before that? in his young days, yeah. Okay. Before that. But I, being Italian, I just thought sure. I'd tell him that, you know. And, uh, and then he got on the uh, Queen Mary, and they didn't tell us where we were going till the third day out that we were going to go to England. And then on, on that ship, you had the, one night you slept in the deck and one night in the bunks. So I slept in the bunk the first night. And you got in there and you couldn't turn around. You had to get out and turn over and go back in if you wanted to turn over. So after that first night, I told them they could have it. I will sleep on the deck every night. And, uh, and then the storm came up, and they, the German uh, U-boats were chasing us. So we had to cha change course every six minutes. They had to change direction. Zigzag. Right. And between that and the storm that came up, we had to, they, we had to change course and wind up in Scotland instead of England. So when we got to Scotland, then we had to take a train to go to England at Cape Weston in England. And then when I got to Cape Weston there, they, uh, the general come up and put me in charge of uh, utilities and gave me 35 men to work with me. We had to put up barracks for the troops that were coming in and did all that. And then I was sent on a special mission, secret mission to London. And I was not to tell nobody what the mission was ever, which I haven't told anybody yet. Is it actually but classified? I, uh, about the mission. Is it I classified or is it this? It was classified, yes. Okay. And I still haven't told nobody. Good for you. Yeah. And while I was there, the V1s and V2s of the Germans were sending down. It was a terrible. I mean, every time came down, it'd whistle, and then they explode. So wherever I was, I put my hands over my head and just lay down there till then they exploded. So I was there for six weeks, and then I went back to Camp Weston. And... Uh, uh, the, How long were you there? Six weeks in London. Before before the D-Day? Oh. In London, well, then I went back to Cape Weston okay. for more training there. And, uh, and then I was, uh, from there, was sent to, uh, to, when we got on the ship, we had to drive 700 miles to go to the, English Channel to cross the ocean. And uh, we were supposed to have a system driver, and my system driver didn't drive. But I didn't let them know that because he was a good buddy of mine and kept me laughing and <laughs> kept me awake. We had this, every 100 miles we stopped for a 10 minute break. So when we got to the uh, ship, then I, all my men was with me. I had 35 of them. We loaded up all the uh, trucks and stuff that we needed. And then we landed into uh, Omaha Beach. And we had to just wait till it was time for the third wave. I was in the third wave to go in. And, and we had to... Ships had to go around. There was so many ships that was crowded. And finally, the time came in for me to go in. And I drove a gasoline truck off the LST onto the beach. 
and I jumped out of it real quick and got my guns and flamethrower and a flare and laid down the ground on the beach there with the dead soldiers. And then I had to crawl up underneath the cliff, so, but I had to move slowly every time the Germans would be shooting. I'd move up a little bit till I got underneath the cliff. Then when I got under the cliff, I got my flamethrower out, and it took two of them to shoot that, and we shot up underneath the cliff with a machine gun on top, was shooting down at us, and I put that all on fire underneath them. So that got rid of that machine gun. And then I shot the flare up in the sky, and I knew the Navy would know what I wanted. And they saw that, and they shot and hit the target there and got rid of some more machine guns up there. And then I laid underneath the cliff that night, and the rangers came in. And they were the first ones to go up the cliff. They had put these uh, rope ladders up to go up, and it was a, so between 100 and 170 feet high. And as they were climbing, the Germans were cutting some of those ropes, and they had to jump to another rope and keep shooting. They got rid of some of those machine guns on their way up there. <clears throat> then I told my men, we had to go up, and some of my, and I lost two of my men as we made the landing there. And that, the ones that didn't have guns, I told them to get the gun off the dead soldiers and follow me up the cliff, which we did, and then we had to fight our way up too. They were still shooting at us. And we finally got up there, and then we were farting our way all the way to St. Lowe. And that took 43 days to secure Spain. St. Louis, and then we continue driving, fighting all our way up to Reims, France. And then when I got to Reims, Captain Thrasher, or General Thrasher, came up to me and put me in charge of the utilities and told me I had to go get some supplies for the soldiers and we're going to stay there to work at uh, Reims, France. and gave me a, a book that had French and English in it. So I took one of my men with me. We went to the, the lumber yard where they had all the stuff that we needed. And I pointed to all the different things that I wanted. And the Frenchman had all the stuff I needed, but he wouldn't sell it to me. So then I turned around, went back to camp. I got me four men in a big truck. I says, follow me. We went back over there. And I told him I wanted that stuff. And he said, no, can't sell it to you. I says, we're here to free your country and you don't want to have sell it to us? So I got my pistol out and pointed it right at him. I says, okay, men, load it all up. So they loaded it all up and I gave him a paper to take to the army to get his money for all the stuff we got. I went back to camp and I told the general what I'd done. He said, oh me, we're going to get in trouble. I said, no we're not, sir. I said, he's afraid I'm going to come back and get him. And we didn't have no trouble. So. Let me back up just a little bit here, back to when you're on the beach. Okay. Because one of the things I've heard from other veterans of that day was the noise, the deafening noise, the, the commotion of the moment. How would you describe it? Well, it was terrible noise and all there, but uh, you just had to not pay much attention. You just had to go on because we had a job to do. We had to do it. How intense was the German fire in that third wave? Yes, it was. It was. It was terrible shooting, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with more with Louis Graziano, World War II veteran, just after the break on Veterans Chronicles.
We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by Louis Graziano, a World War II veteran of D-Day, as well as the Battle of the Bulge. And sir, you were just uh, telling us about how you were able to procure your supplies yes. with, a, with a little bit of coercion. Um, and uh, ultimately, did you get any, any trouble for that? No, I didn't get no trouble for it. <laughs> I thought I was, but I knew we had to have the stuff, so there was no trouble. So where did you go then? Let's see, then I was uh, with the engineer and I was uh, working with him and the general come up there and told the engineer that he wanted to, for him to get those prefab buildings and make a big mess hall. So general left and well, I worked with the engineer and he couldn't quite figure it out. We were working out there for three weeks and uh, the general come back up after three weeks and says, I don't see nothing you've done. He says, oh, well, I'm trying. The general, general looked at me and he says, can you do it? I says, yes, sir, I can do it. I says, can you not step aside and talk? He says, okay, Major, you stay there. So I said, what I want from you, General, is let me use the German prisoners and give me two guards that can speak German and English, and I'll get it up for you. He said, you got it. So General left. Engineer says, you know, Engineer, how you think you're going to do it? And I wouldn't tell him how I was going to do it. So within three weeks, I put the mess hole up. Next thing you know, the general transferred the major route, which was, he was in charge of uh, all the city of Reims and the little red schoolhouse and all. And he put me in charge of all the Reims and the little red schoolhouse. So that's how I got into that little red schoolhouse to be in the room for the surrender. For the surrender. Yeah. What was it like in there? It was terrible in there. I mean, it, the Germans that came in, they were just straight faces. And they just stood up and didn't smile at all. And finally, the uh, they all had a place to sit. There was the uh, British were there, the French and the Russians. All of them had to sign that paper in there for the surrender. And after that was signed, the uh, German old, they stood up, just nodded their heads, and then we took them up to uh, Eisenhower, had two rooms up the hall. He put temporary office there. And he wanted them to come up there to him after we surrounded. He didn't want to be in the room with them when the surrounding was taken. So we took him up there and they come in and he, first thing he asked them was they satisfied with the way the things went for the signing. They said, yes. And he dismissed them. <clears throat> that was the end of that. Now you had spent time with Eisenhower before that, right? Yes. I. Uh, I had to put special telephone line in Eisenhower's headquarters or where he was staying. And uh, I spent two nights there with him before I went back to camp. And he was real nice with us. I had my buddy with me. And uh, he said that unless the officers had enough rank to take care of themselves, so I take care of the listed men. <laughs> So you felt he was down to earth and, oh, and yeah, friendly he even with all the pressure he was dealing with? No, he was real good. Wow. He's after the, the pressure of the GIs. Then, you know, he gave the uh, Rangers, let's see what he got. He, he gave the Rangers uh, these clickers. Oh, the crickets. Before they made the, uh, the invasion, you know. The crickets, right? Yeah. The, uh, like that. That's that's so they would uh, not give the signal away to the Germans where they can find each other after they drop down. One click answered by two yeah. clicks, right? 
they go after the sound and they know there was an American that did that. So that really helped them a lot. That Very was smart. Thing. Wow. Well, let's take another break. We'll be right back with okay. much more with Louis Graziano here on Veterans Chronicles. You're listening to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined today by Louis Graziano, U.S. Army veteran of World War II and of D-Day, as well as the Battle of the Bulge. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, where was your unit placed at the Bulge? Um, <clears throat> the captain came in one night in my quarters, and he says, I want you to go on a special mission with me. I said, is that a request or an order? He says, I can put it in order. I said, let's go. <laughs> so, and it was snowing like anything and cold. We had to go find General Patton's, uh, part of his troop that got lost, that he needed in Bastogne. In Bastogne, they were cut off for six weeks. The German had them cut off. So we went out and we found them between Metz and Reims, and we took them all the way to Bastogne. That's when I got the frozen feet on a trip up to Bastogne. We got them and got them freed from the Germans. And then the captain and I went back to Reims after that, and they put me in the hospital for my frozen feet. They said I got there just in time. It'd been another day I'd have lost them. So they treated them. And then the, uh, but then we, uh, I was there for two weeks and they said, and I said, I want to get back out with my men. I said, well, if you can get, a pair of shoes is two sizes bigger, and put two pairs of socks on, and we'll let you out. So I told my mess sergeant, I said, you be, not mess sergeant, my supply sergeant, to go find me some shoes. So he did, because he knew I'd give him a hard time if he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I got out with my men again. How do your feet respond to cold even now? Well, they're, I can feel the cold right away, and they they just get all all that way. Mm. Isn't that? Wow. Mm -hmm. They so, give me trouble, but I go on. But that was one of the coldest winters Europe had seen in forever. Yeah, it was forever. right below zero. Yeah. So when you had just suffered this, and then you go back out, even with a second pair of socks. You're in a lot of pain, right? Well, at right? that time, I didn't have the combat shoes to go. So I you're mean, still... I just had those shoes here, didn't have the... Didn't have time to get them. We had to go. Wow. Wow. So, how did you react when the, the Battle of the Bulge was finally over? Must have oh, been a great relief. I was well pleased with that because we knew we helped them. Getting those soldiers up there too, and then uh, Patton got across the Rhine River then, and got the Germans. We've kind of talked about this out of order. So after the bulge, you went down to Reims. Yeah, went back to Reims. Back to Reims, right? Mm -hmm. So we talked about the moment in the Little Red Schoolhouse with the surrender and Eisenhower's reaction. What was it like for you? Not to just see the surrender, but to know you were witnessing history. Well, yeah, I was honored and great pleasure to be there for that surrender. And, and I felt sorry for all the men that we lost that helped us accomplish that. What did you do immediately after the surrender? What happened to you then? Well, then I was uh, just putting in time, waiting to go home, really. And what did and, you do during that time? Well, I wonder, well, with my buddy and I, 
Oh, that's. He said, uh, let's go to the ball game. I said, uh, okay. So we went to the ball game and he had his girlfriend with him. And uh, the girl that was pitching the ball, I said, who's that lady? And the, his girl said, that's Bobby. She's my best friend. I said, okay. And I knew where she worked, at the orderly room. She was in the service. And uh, I went to see her the next day, made a date with her. She said, okay. So I went to pick her up. And when I got there, they told me she's already left with somebody. So I turned around and went back to camp. So, and her girlfriends told her that she'd never get another date with me. She told them she would. And about three weeks later, I went back and made another date with her. And this time she was there and she stayed. And we were together for 63 years. How soon were you married? Oh, after that, it was a few months. And we uh, <clears throat> got married there, and the uh, Colonel Boschoff let me use his staff car for us to go on our honeymoon to Paris <laughs> for a whole week. Fantastic. And you got married in Reims, correct? Yeah, in Reims, right. That's a great story. I love that story. Yeah. And then... Then uh, when it was time to go home, her ship left the day before my she had to go with the women, and my ship left the day after. So I got home. Well, I got back in Christmas Day. I figured she should have been already home. I called her house parents over there, and. They said, no, they hadn't heard nothing from her. So that went on for 30 days. Couldn't find her? Before I found out that her ship had wrecked. And another ship had to come from the state. And the Enterprise ship left for the States and it was going to dry dock. But they had to turn around and go back and get them. And then she finally sent me a letter out, uh, and the letter's in my book that I wrote. I put it in there. <laughs> and uh, that was, and then when I got, uh, when, and then when I landed there, and we were supposed to land in New Jersey, but the storm was so bad we had to land at uh, Virginia. Uh, and then when we got there, they told us we had to wait, I had to wait two weeks before we found somebody to take us to Fort Dix. So I spoke up, I says, I'm the master sergeant here. I says, I can take the group to New Jersey because I'm from New York. So they said, okay, we'll let you. So I took the group, we didn't have to wait the two weeks. Then went to New Jersey, got discharged and went home. Then when I got home, my father, the first thing he did was got that record out and played it. <laughs> I said, did I say all that? <laughs> and by the way, I got married. Although he probably already knew that, right? Pardon? Did he know you had gotten married? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. They, they said, then when she finally got there and went to the house, they said, she's not French. I said, I never did say she was French. <laughs> But being married over there, they thought I was bringing home a French girl. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, so then you went back to your to, well, your, to your stylist. Yes, then stylist. I went back. My sister was still having her beauty shop, so I went back to work in there. And uh, now I've heard that you know, and, and I've talked to many veterans who struggle to transition back to mm -hmm. regular life. From what I've read. You didn't have that issue. You it came very naturally to you to go back to the way it was. Yeah, I went back to it and there was no trouble getting back with the hair. Of course, there was a lot of things that came out that wasn't going on when I was a stylist. Like the permanent, you know, 
Then we had machines that we had to curl with the heat, no. And the coal wave permit came after I left, where they just put the solution down and didn't have to put them under the heat. Okay. So I had to learn all that. It didn't take me no time. Okay. On that. So a few yeah. fads came in before uh, you got home. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and the first thing I did when I went to the gas station to get some gas, I pulled up my tank and I left. Just like in the Army, you know, we go. <laughs> you didn't pay. And I got way up the line. I says, ooh, I didn't pay that guy. Of course, I had done business with him before I went in the Army. So he knew me, and I knew him nice to do his wife's hair. <laughs> so I went back and said, I wasn't worried about it. I knew you'd come back. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get in the habit, it's hard to remember sometimes. Uh, yeah. Oh, man. So, and then ultimately, you, you moved south after that at some point? Oh, then I, uh, well, in the tra beauty trade, my wife didn't like the snow up north. She wanted to go back south. She was from Alabama. Oh, okay. So, in the beauty trade magazine, he was looking for a hairstylist in Augusta at Belk's department store. And we was visiting her sister, which lived in South Carolina. I said, well, with this close, let's go down there and talk to them about the job down there. So I went and talked to him and signed a contract with him to go to work for him. And every week that I was there, they would pay me a salary. And then once I made over the amount of the salary, then I'd get commission too. So they wouldn't, wouldn't pay me my commission, kept telling me it was coming from headquarters, which was North Carolina. The headquarters was in Charlotte, North Carolina, of, of that company. And I had a lot of customers that came to me from Thompson, Georgia, which was 35 miles away, to get their hair done. And they told me, well, I ought to come to Thompson and open up a shop. So, one of the ladies from Thompson called me one day and says, I found a place for you. I said, okay, I'll take a look and see. So I went up, looked and rented the place, went back on the Monday morning down at Milk's and I said, now I want my commission. Says, it's still in come in. I said, okay, I'm leaving right now. And I had all my pictures and stuff on the wall. I took everything down. And put everything on the desk, I said, here, you can check all this over, and make sure that I'm not taking none of your stuff, that they wouldn't look at it. So I picked up and left. And nope, went over there and got the shop ready and opened up the beauty shop in Thompson. And got busy all the time. Sometimes I worked till two o'clock in the morning. Really? Yeah. Wow. And that was very successful there, right? Yeah, it was, and it, I'm still doing here. You're still doing hair? Yeah, I still got some of my old customers won't turn me loose. <laughs> so now... I love it. Now I just have them call me on my cell phone. The one, I'll say, okay, meet me at the shop. That's so great. The shop is still going. My daughter's working it. That's wonderful. It's a family, multi-generation business now. Mm-hmm. So we only have a couple minutes left in our conversation here, Louis. Uh, what, when you think about your service, what do you think of most? Well, I think I was honored to be there and I did everything I was supposed to do. I didn't let nothing bother me, any job. I was sent to so many different places to do different things, you know because I was with General Eisenhower's headquarters special troop command. And uh, any time they needed something special, they'd send me out to do it. I was glad to do it. It's amazing. And I think it was an honor. I had the chance as a student to see the room in the Little Red Schoolhouse where the signing took place, and now it's behind plexiglass. Yeah, I... With, I uh, almost silhouettes of who was who sitting at the table and so forth. And right. 
obviously it looks a little bit different than it did that day. Yeah, I took care of that room there. And that was quite a big table there too. There was- Yeah, you had to fit a lot of people said, around there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Louie, we thank you very much for your service to our country, uh, most of all. And we thank you also for your time with us today. Thank you well, for coming thank in. Thank you, I appreciate that. Louis Graziano is a U.S. Army veteran of World War II. He saw action at D-Day and also served at the Battle of the Bulge and was a witness to the signing of the German surrender on May 7, 1945. Last survivor. Last survivor, exactly right. I'm Greg Karumbas. This is Veterans Chronicles.